So and that's what, one of the things is what we want to, I want to try and set expectations with you guys on the bean side. And where this will all fit in, we'll do some agronomy. I'll talk a little bit about depth and data seeding and a little bit about disease to give you a bigger picture. But I also want to set expectations of where, where soybean production is going to go. <coughs> we see bean production in Western Canada exponentially increasing. We're looking for other crops to grow. And as a grower myself, I want an option. If you, well, throughout the course of me talking about beans, I want you to think about pulses. Okay? A lot of similarities in terms of pulses that you can do, especially on the seeding side of it and also on the harvesting side. So keep that around the idea around what beans and, and pulses are like so that'll kind of put things into perception for you. But there is a huge difference between pulses and beans. The biggest thing being is heat units. We are still not quite there, so we've consistently got a bean variety that we can grow on the majority of the acres in Western Canada. We're getting closer, we're working at those things. We've got a couple that are pretty close right now but I want you guys to be fully aware of what some of those risks around them are doing. We've had some great successes in southern and central Saskatchewan in the last couple of years with having relatively good springs and having wide open falls where guys are getting some pretty really, some really, really good yields and are really excited about them. But we all know what farming is about, that there's always a correction coming sometime. And it's about risk management for the most part. So I'm going to cover a host of different things around beans. <coughs> And this just kind of gives you an idea about the genetic gain that we've seen over the last number of years with beans. And this is all based in the U.S. With Pioneer Hybrid, we're built on beans and corn. Canola is a relatively new crop for us within Pioneer. So we've got tons and tons of research. We know where this is all going. We've seen the bean trends. And you'll start to see where we're getting better and better averages as we start to move up. And this is 2008. And we're starting to see a leveling off, but it's, it's all about genetics. We're trying to find that next bean variety that'll grow better in its environment. And the thing about beans is it's very, very particular to different areas. It isn't just you can't blanket a bean like we do often with canola and say it'll grow everywhere from the Peace River country down to southern Manitoba. Beans are very area specific, as is the case with corn. So we're going to have to work at finding what beans are going to do best in each area. So what I mean by that is we might have Y61s or our new marine bean varieties coming out in Estevan that might do very well, but they may not do as well here. And it's going to take some time to learn those things and going to have to work through some of those hiccups as we go along. <coughs> Excuse me. So in, so in Western Canada, I think I found out what happened when you're, Rob, when your thing came up. It's taken a little, some stuff off the slides, but not a big deal. It gave a little warning when we put it on Rob's computer, and I don't know what it did, but it might have took away some numbers, because these are actually the years as we go down here, and this one here I think is down to 2002, I think, all the way up to where we're just over 800,000 acres in 2011, 2012. So we're looking at probably close to 3 to 4 million acres of beans over the next 10 years evolving into Western Canada. Manitoba is the big player in the market right place, place right now, but I do not believe that they will continue to be that way. So this, this whole accelerated yield technology is just kind of a holistic picture to show you that we look at thousands of lines, bring them down to one or two, bring them to the field, and then try and make them work here for and adapt them for different areas of Western Canada. And it's the same principle within corn as it is with canola, although the numbers may change between crops, the principles are still the same. And <coughs> You know, our, our, our whole entire goal is not always about yield, it's also about agronomics, and that's a key thing. We want to find that variety that's best suited to its area. So variety selection is absolutely critical. Like in the case of corn, the number one thing for us that we need to concern ourselves about with soybeans is maturity. So in the bean market, maturity is the number one influencer. What we are looking for is developing triple zero beans here for Western Canada. That we think is absolutely essential to expand those acres. And right now the acres we're kind of looking at is kind of number one highway a little bit north, but as you work across the southern part of Saskatchewan, we need those heat units and moisture and other conditions to be favorable for beans. And of course heat units is the key thing. We need a triple zero bean to adopt those to different acres. It's just the way it works and I'll show you how that works here in a second. So this is kind of the maturity scale when you think of beans. 
There's triple zeros all the way at the top, which are the earliest, all the way down to sevens, which are the latest. Okay? But within each of those, and this is Western Canada maturity range, we have some zeros growing in Manitoba, but they've got extra heat units because they're warmer nights and warmer days. A lot of the rest of their beans are double zeros. We are working at triple zeros. We're not quite there yet. But within each of those individual, there's a nine scale within each of these. Okay? So in the case of double zeros, there's a double zero one all the way to nine rating scale. So it's not just as simple as having a double zero, a one, a two, or a three, I and mean, you were talking about disasters with older varieties, you were probably working with stuff that were in the one or two maturity range that just wasn't suited here for Western Canada yet. So double zero Y61s has a maturity of zero six. What we are looking at this year coming out are two new varieties that'll run, we think they'll probably be Y, uh, double zero Y31s and 41s. We don't know for sure what the name's gonna be but they're actually about 50 to 75 heat units earlier, which will put us down into that 2325 to 2350. Our, our Y61s right now run us at 2425 for heat units, for crop heat units. They're there, but they're not quite there. What we want to have is double zero, triple zero beans grown here in Western Canada. We think we're between three and five years out having our first triple zero bean variety for Western Canada. And that's a huge thing for us as growers because that opens not only up acres but gives a higher probability of getting that crop off successfully. Okay? Any questions so far on that? What are the triple zero pushes? We think triple zeros, depending on that one to nine scale, will be down into that 2100 when we finish. So that's more like corn, getting down into the 2000s, 2050s. <clears throat> Can we get down to 1900s? Possibly. Maybe we'll have to change the maturity scale, but that'll get us down into that between 2050 and 2100 is where we think that'll be for maturity for beans. It's going to take time because we're not really a big bean, bean market, but we're now becoming that and growers are saying we want to grow them. So we're, we're evolving and adapting those, those genetics to this area further north. So some quick soil considerations around growing beans. Uh, this seems fairly simple, but if you think around when you grow pulses, it's the same idea. You want to try and have those fields that are better suited. Beans aren't like a cereal crop to stand up. They do want to go down. Um, warm soil is absolutely critical. <coughs> Excuse me. Rolling is also critical, like we do with pulses, so there's a lot of similarities around growing beans. I'll talk a little bit about that later when we got into it. Uh, rolling itself is they've got two basic um, doing the work in Manitoba and you've picked your right field, it's relatively rock field and we know we can't eliminate, eliminate all those things. But when you take a look at when you want to roll them, the best success for beans is either at one or two stages. Pre-emergence, which they got the best yields, or at the first trifoliate. So you've got a little bit of a window for, for, for rolling, but you still basically want to get out and roll them as quick as you can. Okay, so it's just like a pulse. We do a lot of the same similarity things. Fertility requirements, corn versus beans. <coughs> One key thing on this slide is about starter fertilizer. Beans do not like starter fertilizer, and that's got to do with the salt index. So one of the things we're going to have to adapt is about how we're going to get those nutrients down. We don't want them with the seed. As long as they're far enough away from the seed, we won't have any issues. But their salt index and tolerance to fertilizer is high. They don't like it. Okay? So that's a risk we're going to have to start to work with. Can change things in terms of how we manage that. So the planting practices are pretty straightforward. Early planting and how this goes is deals with a number of nodes in which you can you, you want to try and grow as many pods as you possibly can. And that aligns with the maximum photosynthetic demand. And, and when you think of heat units, um, corn, or not corn, beans, when they get into the ground, they need warm soil temperatures. It's absolutely critical. In Manitoba, the corn goes in first. Then they put their beans in towards the latter part of May into the first week of June. Soil temperatures are 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. They're boom, they're in the ground, and they're coming out very quickly. That's absolutely critical for beans as well, having warm temperatures. And I know everything's supposed to have warm soil temperatures to grow as best you can. But beans and corn, when you're dealing with accumulating crop heat units, you want to have them into warm ground 
to get them out to grow as quick as they possibly can to get to physiological maturity. It's absolutely critical. So when you look at basic uh, planting date, how it can affect soybean yields, this top line is in the U.S. and Eastern Canada. So the earlier is better. Now you got to remember their climates are quite a bit different. They're warmer earlier than us in a lot of these areas, which makes sense. But where does that fall into ours? This is an imaginary line that I drew in where I think that'll roughly fall. So sometime in around May, May 19th is a good starting point. It's not written in stone, guys. It's all about what your, your individual year is like, what your soil temperature is like, moisture, all those things. But you want to make sure as warmer is better. Okay? So what this individual slide de depicts is it's, it's really around stress. <coughs> and there's a lot of things that go into building yield in beans. Those, this bottom, these bottom three down here are the biggest ones in terms of what limits our yield here in Saskatchewan. The number of flowers, and that's got a lot to do with environmental stresses. The number of seeds per pod and seed size are all indicative, and that has a lot to do with maturity at our fall frost. But what I'm trying to detect with, depict with this is that when you look at a, a soybean plant's life cycle, between 40 and 80 percent of its growth period is where the majority of all these things are built in. Having any kind of stress at this time is absolutely critical and can really diminish your overall yield expectations. And one of the key things around having moisture in the first week of August, beans need moisture in the first week of August for pod fill. So if we don't get that, you can have a great looking bean crop but don't have enough moisture to fill pods and your yield expectations can go down. And of course we live in a climate that has lots of stresses at different times. So. So when you look at seeding rates, uh, if you're looking at 30 inch rows, if you're using a corn planter or a bean planter, you're somewhere in between 140 and 160,000 seeds when planted in those 30 inch rows. If you're solid seeding, then you want to be somewhere between 200 and 225. In the last four years of putting beans in Western Canada, we're right around that 210 to 225 seems to be the best mark to, uh, at, to get us our average plant stands. And of course, low plant populations can, can be limiting to overall yield. And if it's a really crappy looking spring, guys are increasing their seeding rates by 10% just to compensate for that. Okay? So you, I had a question when I was walking around. So increasing seeding rate in soybeans, is that going to help speed up the period? It will a little bit, but not a lot. If you go from 200 to 250,000 seeds, you're not going to gain two weeks of maturity. You might get a, get a day or two at max. It's not a huge thing. It's all around that crop's ability to accumulate heat units. It has a little bit of an impact because you're dealing with interplant competition, but it's not significant. Okay, so planting depth. Uh, there's still a little bit of work, a little bit of a debate because I've got guys that are saying they don't go at an inch and a half. Some guys are putting them in at three quarters of an inch or half an inch. And they're probably getting away with that just simply because we've had that excess moisture at seeding. But beans do take an awful lot of moisture to get them fully germinated. You do not want to leave them stranded on the top of the ground. So ideally, if you want to look at a seeding rate, I like or seeding depth somewhere around an inch is probably ideal, up to an inch and a half. And then I talked about soil temperature is absolutely critical, over 10 degrees C. And that's an average. So if you've got a morning and an afternoon and your average temperature is 10 degrees C, a couple, three days in a row, and if the long-term forecast looks pretty promising. Great time to start pounding beans in if you're going to do them. So. so this has a lot to do with row spacing. <coughs> and where this comes from is all about that interplant competition. We talked about it doesn't have a huge impact to maturity, but it does in terms of weed control and that whole plant's ability to cover that ground and utilize sunlight. You can see here on a 30-inch row how much black dirt there is. You go to 15 to 7s. When you, here's another picture, these are Y92s from the US um, in Tennessee, but you'll certainly see how that ground cover advantage occurs when you've got 15 inch rows versus 30 inch rows. So using our regular seating equipment at 12 or 15 inches or 12 or 10 is perfectly fine. It does very well because you get the near plant competition. But as we move towards more corn acres being adopted and guys are going to different drills and trying different things to seed corn, 15 inches, there's not a thing wrong with putting beans down to 15 inches. It's less critical. Okay? So fungicides and treatments, this is all about plant, um, 
optimizing plant emergence and trying to get the best bang for your buck. Um, you'll see a little bit more when I get into the latter part in terms of diseases to give you guys an indication that seed treatments and all these things are a must and that's the way beans will come. Um, it's still by far the best option for us for maximizing yield potential. So when you look at on-farm plots that we put on with Pioneer, when you're using the seed treatments and the combination of insecticide and seed treatments, you're getting that, basically that almost a four bushel acre advantage. And it's no different whether you're dealing with cereals or whatever, you heard about that this morning, seed treatments and insecticides are a key component. As more acres come in, we'll be dealing with more insects on beans as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So inoculant is an absolute and is an essential, uh, is an, an essential step. It is not an option. You need to inoculate. The overall recommendation is to do one and a half times um, at the time when you're treating. You do one and a half times of your inoculant and then an inferal granular is your best option. Beans need a lot of inoculant and it's your best success to get that maximum yield out of it. So what I mean by that is this kind of gives depicts that whole thing that if you get here's a plant on the bottom that doesn't have any inoculant on it, here's one that has both um, on C but also in furrow granular inoculant and why that's critical is because you get your, your initial inoculation taking place right here on your main <coughs> part of your root but that in furrow granular inoculant that guys are finding the best successes in successfully growing beans is by, by putting in furrow gives you those secondary nodulation which improves your overall yield and helps that plant maximize its yield potential. Okay, so inoculation is a must. Any questions so far? Would you recommend to do both? Yeah. Seed, seed and yeah. Very least do the do the seed. But one and a half times just get you started. If you can do infer with it is by far the best option. Yeah, it's your best success. Okay. So now we'll move into staging and weed control. So Here's a picture of, a depicted picture of a bean. So we've got basically what you see here in this, in this cup. As it starts to merge, we go into what we call V-emergence. We've got our cotyledons. We've got our first unifold leaf will start to open up here as we go into V1. And why this is critical is you'll start to see some of these timing issues around staging and weed control. Okay? We do a little bit of, a little bit of plant science here. So cotyledons. Okay, then we've got our unifoliate leaves. Bef after V1 starts, then we start to get our trifoliate leaves. So we've got two leaves opening up, and then we start to get three leaves showing up. That's, the, that's what starts happening with the trifoliate leaves. And those are critical for knowing what a bean plant looks like as you start to stage, especially around herbicide timing. Okay, so this is a V2 plant. Your unifoliate leaves are down here, but these are your sets of trifoliate leaves. Okay. Unifoliate are the first two that come out after your cotyledons, then you've got sets of trifoliate leaves, and you go V2, V4, V6, and so on as the plant starts to mature. Okay? So why that's critical is V1, where that first node starts to open up, that's your first indicator when you can start to control weeds. Okay? So your unifoliate leaves are opened up, and your trifoliate leaves, your first set is just now starting to open up. That's your first time in which you can go in with an in-crop herbicide. Okay? When you start the beginning of bloom, you'll have one open flower on the main stem. That's the absolute tail end of when you want to be spraying. I don't recommend going that far, but that's still within the stages that's optimal, and they say that's perfectly okay. If you combine that with what you've got for proper plant populations and your row spacing, and if we're using conventional tillage or con conventional air drills, We've got lots of interplant competition and weed, can, weed uh, competition won't be as critical so that allows us to control our weeds in a timely fashion. If we're starting looking at 15 or 30 inch rows and that becomes more critical because that interplant competition, you can have more open space and more chances for weeds being an issue. Okay? So here's a little soybean fact that only 50 to 80 percent of the flowers produce pods. So there's an awful lot of flowers and stuff that open up does anybody know what it is for canola? Come on, you guys are old canola growers. Probably heard. 
Actually, canola is between 45 and 55 percent of the flowers you see actually produce viable pods. So there's a lot of pods that are open up but still don't produce actual plants. It's just a function of how plants grow. Okay? So this whole portion, I'm not going to spend a pile of time on this. It's got to do about rates and glyphosate. <coughs> you can go in with a liter equivalency uh, up to two times with beans. So you've got the options of putting on higher rates with beans. You can put up to two liters of equivalency in glyphosate. Um, timing is critical. Lots of guys do combinations, pre-burn, all those type of things, and can manage the weed situation quite easily. Um, but that's the benefits of it. This is just basically your total application between the two. We do have some stuff for Roundup Pretty Canola because it is going to be an issue when you're dealing with Roundup Pretty Beans and Roundup Pretty Canola growing in the same area. Here's some options for you that you've got for controlling volunteers. So we're working on new products in crop that are actually, as they're moving down the line and we develop new genetics, we're looking to be able to do that as an in crop that will go in a combination with a another chemistry that will actually control volunteers with your glyphosate when you make in crop applications. All the companies are working on some of those things as we move forward, but for right now these are some of your best options right now. So. They are not actually all that terribly bad simply because they do not, um, they just, anything that's volunteer, they tend to rot out very quickly and they don't cause a huge problem with volunteers. They're just usually not a big, big deal. A lot like peas, you don't seem to be an awful lot of peas grow the second year, so. I think it's because it's a crop. Yeah, it's, it's a concern, but it, it's not usually a big deal. If you're following a, well, as good a rotation as you possibly can, there's lots of chemistry that'll control them, so. <laughs> Guys looking at me, I know what rotations are all about too. I, I hear you, but it'll be managing things a little bit differently. So there'll be some changes, but <coughs> excuse me. So any questions so far on that? We get into some diseases. Okay. So not all of these are going to be a huge issue for us right away. As more and more bean acres start to be grown, we'll start to do no different than we have with cereals or with canola, or with peas, or whatever the case may be, lentils. There'll be diseases we'll have to start to learn how to manage. The first one is Phytophthora, which actually our varieties have, Phytophthora has a whole different strains, and you'll see in our pamphlets, we have a lot of different strains that are resistant to certain levels of Phytophthora, but the key is we don't know what we've got here in our soils yet, and we don't know how much they're going to manifest themselves into giving us an issue around diseases. But, we do have a level of resistance, but I want to give you an idea what this is all about so it kind of starts to familiarize, your size, familiarize yourselves with what this is all about. So we know it has many races and multiple races can occur in each field. It really, if you think about it, it's around the seed, lot, uh, seed rot or seedling decay that we often think about with canola. So there's actually three different phases that it goes through. We go through an initial phase that can occur at seed rot. It can, all occur, it can also occur when the plants are starting to establish at the seedling blight stage, and we can also get it later on as the plant starts to mature, which occurs at the root and the stem rot phases. So it's continuous throughout the year and can have different impacts to how the plant can actually mature and overall set yield. So this kind of give you a picture. Um, for those of you that have grown it, you may not have seen this, but as you start to grow more and more beans, you may start to see these areas that all of a sudden prematurely ripen, get this browning portions in here and these wilting plants in amongst healthy plants, that's Phytophthora. It's a rot that basically kills the plants off. Okay? So there's, and initially there's two, the, the first two stages being the seed rot phase. This can actually occur right away when the seed goes in the ground. Um, it'll turn mushy, so it's a seed rot. That's a first sign of having Phytophthora. And then, of course, your seeds won't come out of the ground. You'll be missing plants, and that's part of what can happen with this disease. The seed, seedling blight phase can occur quite often later when you get a damping off. The plant will try to establish, but the roots can't properly fully form and end up with a wilted, dying plant. So quite often we'll see that with canola or cereals or other crops as well. It's a damping off, in essence, of what that's about. And we can get the root rot, the rot, uh, the root rot phase. This actually occurs um, as the plant starts to... Um, get considerably larger when flowering is taking place. We'll often see a reduction in nodulation, which is a key factor when your plants start to flower. If you pull those plants and it doesn't look like it's doing very well and you don't find any nodulation, it's quite often that you'll have Phytophthora taking a hold of that plant as well. 
at that point. And the worst case scenario is when it starts to happen later on, and you'll get these dark to red-brown lesions may progress up the, up the stem, and this isn't the greatest picture, but it starts at the root and works itself all the way up and just basically shuts that plant down. So there are diseases that can impact beans. White mold sclerotinia, nothing new for us. I'll talk a little bit about that after lunch on the canola sides of stuff, but beans are also susceptible to white mold or sclerotinia. So... <coughs> Depending on the year, um, wet, moist conditions are favorable for white mold, irregardless of what crop it's in. We know it as sclerotinia stem rod, exactly the same thing. It, ho it hosts on a hundred numbers of different species. Beans, peas, um, weed species are all hosts for this, so it'll be a, another disease that we'll have to manage within beans as it starts to come into more and more prevalent. But there are two things that growers have worked with, and we've learned this, uh, working whether it's row width or plant populations to see how we can minimize the impact of the disease. In the case of canola, we don't see a huge reduction of having either more plants or less plants or wider rows versus narrow rows with sclerotinia. We still tend to get a fair amount of it, irregardless, because it's more of an impact from environment. With beans, we tend to see some of the similar things, but row widths in terms of where growers have gone is many growers now that have grown traditional beans they went down to 15 inch rows to reduce wild mo white mold in the U.S. and in Manitoba too versus solid seeding 7 inches and the, re the real advantage is they're giving some of that yield benefit versus 30. So they're having an in between a uh, solid seeded bean versus a wider row at 15 versus 30 to have a reduction because there's airflow through the canopy tends to be better for beans and not having white mold and they're seeing that in terms of a yield benefit. So 15 inch rows seems to be the magic number for most bean growers right now. And we roughly saw about a 5% yield advantage for both 7 and 15 over 30 inch rows and that's interplant competition and even though there was an offset thing with having more white mold it quite often was beneficial and 15 seems to be the magic number. And with plant populations if you increase plant populations you're going to have a higher chance of having white mold show up. And don't be alarmed when I'm talking 220,000 plants per per acre with a solid seeded type thing is not out of the norm. That's perfectly okay for interplant competition. If you think of where that'll be, that's roughly 8 to 10 plants per square foot. In a pulse world, that's not too far out. That's pretty good. It's when you really start to get a lot of plants, you can start to see white mold start to be a problem. What that works out to in pounds per acre, 68 or 70 pounds? Ballpark. Yep. Iron chlorosis. <laughs> this one I know Rob, uh, Rob had asked me about. Um, guys had concerns with, with this being an issue. It is a problem in, in some areas. So iron chlorosis, the, the main and primary symptom is iron deficiency and it causes intervenal chlorosis within an individual bean plant. It has a distinct yellowing and a network of dark green. And this isn't the best picture because I've had to compress these down. But you'll see that. Um, I think there might be one later on where you'll have everything as a light whitish yellowish green and then your veins are actually quite dark green. That's a classic symptom of what iron chlorosis is about. And they don't show up on the cotyledons, the seed leaves. It has to wait till the plant actually gets fairly mature before you start to see this occur. And it will be no more or less around the trifoliate leaves. You talk about when you're dealing with spring and herbicide timing, remember we just talked about that. When you start to get those trifoliate leaves starting to pop open, that's when you can start to see some of these symptoms taking place of iron chlorosis. <coughs> now, most of our soils do, and they have an abundance of iron. However, it's the deficiency of the soil chemical reactions doesn't make the iron, it makes it unavailable to the plants. And what I mean by that is you need to have oxygen. So waterlogged soils is where iron can't be taken up by the roots of a soybean plant and that's what starts to show those characteristics take place. So because it's not, absor uh, it's, it's not uh, soluble, it can't be absorbed by those pl individual plants and you'll often see these characteristics take place when you get those really high soluble salt areas, saline areas, excess carbonates um, or excess moisture. So when Rob asked me about this being and how much of a big issue is it going to be, for the most part, unless you've got irrigated land that has a lot of standing water for long periods of time or it's excessively wet, iron chlorosis could be a bit of an issue. 
I don't see it being a huge problem for most of the ground we're on. And the other thing is about pH. It is more prevalent in pH that's higher than 7.5, but it doesn't mean it's going to manifest itself. And I don't know what, I think you guys are what, 7, 8 to 8-ish? Yeah, 8 yeah, see, and a lot of the ground, even where I'm at, is about 8, is our pH is 8. That is less of a concern, as is around the excessive amount of moisture, and that plant not being able to take in the iron when it's under saturated conditions, or wet feet, in other words. So that will be more of an issue for iron corrosive, so it shouldn't be a huge issue. But you may see it, and there are areas that do. And there are areas in the Minnesota, Dakotas, and even some into Manitoba that have some of these soil types that have standing water that can cause issues for it. But I don't think it's a huge concern for us. So photo period response. This is one that I want to give you guys an idea just on how this all works because beans are like this and this all has to do with when beans flower. Now it can be called photosensi photosensitivity, day length sensitivity, photo period, light sensitivity, there's a whole bunch of names out there, irregardless of what it's called. What it relates to is a soybean's ability to change from that vegetative stage into a reproductive stage flowering. And that's got to do with the change in day length or shorter nights. So <coughs> soybeans need both a change in photo period. So we've got to have that change in day length. As the days are getting longer to June 21st, when they start to shorten up, that's a trigger for the plant to then start to produce flowers. And the other key thing is heat units. It needs to have those heat units to get to physiological maturity. Now, heat units are different than growing degree days. Growing degree days are a max and a min temperature. And you'll take an example of 10 degrees at night, 30 degrees in the day, gives you an, a total of 40. You divide that by two and then take off a base temperature for growing degree days. So you're looking at about 15 growing degree days approximately any time during the season. That's just a, just a snapshot in time. Whereas a heat unit is actually the max and, the max and min temperature divided by two. So you'll end up with 20 versus 15, but you need to have those heat units there to get that crop to physiological maturity. And that's as critical as it is in terms of photo response. So each variety needs that critical period of darkness, in other words, shorter days and longer nights, to get to that reproductive stage of starting to produce flowers. Okay? <coughs> so, and this kind of just re I guess I got a little bit ahead of myself here, but you know, this talks about when we get to putting your beans and you want to have them grow through a certain amount of vegetative growth. In other words, you don't want to put your beans in too late and then they don't have enough time to get out of the ground and actually grow and put a whole bunch of plant on before they start to set flowers. I've seen that in the past where it's cold soils, they sit in the ground, they sit in the ground, they sit in the ground, then when they start to grow they'll, they'll pod very close to the ground and you want to try to avoid that. And one of the biggest things to do in the soil temperature is critical to that, but it's all around this whole um, day length sensitivity and getting those plants to actually flower. And that's why they're referred to as a short day plant. And that can vary depending on your areas. But guys that put them in, in uh, and I'm talking more from Manitoba perspective, but seeing them the last few days of May into the first week of June, they'll grow a really good vegetative. Then all of a sudden as day length starts to change, they produce flowers. Is what photo period response is about. So if you took, for example, because summer days are actually longer in the north, as we know, because we live up here. And our varieties that we've developed in terms of double zeros, and we're working on triple zeros, I mentioned earlier, to try and adapt them to these longer, uh, into our longer seasons and longer days and cooler nights. If a northern variety has moved south, basically what it does is it will start to flower earlier because the nights are longer. So you can take our double zeros and move them actually into the northern or southern Minnesota into the mid-United States, and they won't hardly put any vegetative state on. They'll start to flower right away at the ground because they're responding to the day length. That's what triggers them into reproduction. So each variety has got to be adapted. We don't have a huge difference within Western Canada, but there is quite a bit of difference between Southern Manitoba as you get into parts of Western Saskatchewan into the Peace River country that has a lot of day length. We'll have to start to divide or develop varieties that are better suited for each of those areas as we go forward. So kind of in summary, bean, bean performance itself is regionally sensitive. I talked about that. <coughs> we need to look at varieties, all different varieties, on you guys' farms. Um, you can take a, another ver competitor's variety and it'll say it's a 2350 heat units. 
Ours will be a 2375 or a 2475. Each of the companies use different parameters about how they develop maturity. The best way for you guys to know is take a couple, three different varieties and see which works best for you. You will start to see some of these varieties that are photosensitive in terms of day length. They'll look like they're actually maturing earlier, but when all said and what, when it comes down to what's being said and done, at the very end when they get the heat units, you get the moisture during August and that killing frost comes to fill them out, whichever that date may be, your yields are very, very, very little. But you still the best way to do it is to look at the varieties on your own farm. And I do believe there will be a difference between moose jaws, you go 50 miles north of here because we're going to see some differences in climate. And that's just how it's going to be. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to plant into warm soils. We need to inoculate that two times. And the two times is one and a half times at seeding. Uh, well, on the seed and then, of course, in furrow is your best option. Timely weed control is critical. So we've talked about that V1 all the way up to first flower is the very, very latest you want to, you want to go in in terms of controlling beans. And then harvest losses. We've got our equipment is already set for beans. We can straight cut them the way they are. We don't have to adopt a whole bunch of new equipment, but there are guys trying a whole host of different things in trying to see which is best suited. So an experiment on your farms. Try a few acres. Um, in the past two years, we've had growers in southeastern Saskatchewan have gone from trying 40 acres up to six, seven, 800 acres, just like that. And I, you know, I still think we need to walk before we run, get good at growing them, understand them better. And as we have better varieties to give you a higher success, we'll certainly do a better job. We can grow them here but I still think we need to move towards some earlier maturing beans and that's why we're working for triple zeros. We'll have a great step forward with the two new ones that are coming out. We'll be looking at them all over southern Saskatchewan into central Saskatchewan. So we'll have a good range of where they mature up and have uh, certainly open up some more doors and windows for us down the road for that. So. What about shattering? Uh, all beans are, but there's, we actually have a rating scale on them. The new ones, I don't know how they'll come in. We haven't evaluated them yet. <clears throat> so any other questions about beans? Excuse me. Do you desiccate them? Most guys don't. They just let frost kill them. You need, because they're, if it was a triple, ze triple zero bean that was a triple zero 21 and it was actually mature soon enough, then you could, pre yeah, you could ripen them off and kill them that way to harvest them, but most beans take right to the very end of frost kills them. That's your desiccant. Uh, for beans, they've got to be less than 15% moisture, I believe, for dry. What's typical harvest time, like September? Well, it depends when that, you're going to need that frost to shut them down. And if that occurs on September 15th, then guys go and do moisture, they'll go in and harvest them whatever works. Some guys take them off a little higher moisture. Uh, you don't want to wait till they're too dry because you end up kind of splitting them like a piece. You don't want to leave them too late. So a lot like a pulse. If you hit them at 16, 17, 18 percent moisture and harvest them, throw them in a bin and dry them down a little bit, aerate them. How many Yeah, no, you're not, Adam, automatically going in. I think part of this whole thing when we deal with beans is um, you've got, we've got products that are registered for, for disease control. If you think of it like a pulse, most of your stuff that's done at that right stage to maximize in between that second and basically V8 type, your last before flowering, is probably your best window for controlling most of the diseases and what's applicable to beans. Yeah, to go in four times and do it. I don't think we're quite there yet. We need to kind of focus on them from being a one or two application. I know you guys are used to spraying lots on lentils, but beans are a lot, a little different than, well, they're a lot different than, than lentils, so. <coughs> Excuse me, my apologies. Yep. You had said they're very sensitive to seed row place fertilizer, so do you recommend yes. no fertilizer in seed row? Um, there are, if you're using like our conventional equipment now, if you're putting down up to five pounds of FOSS, if you've got a fair amount of row width, you're okay. But if you're dealing with some of the planters and where this mostly comes from is from double disc drills, you just can't put any fertilizer with it. It's got to be away from it. But if you're doing an infurl, a few pounds is fine. But you, wanna, don't, you don't want to put 25 pounds of FOSS and your other things down in a blend. You need to get them away from the seed with beans. Okay, so if you're only using like 10% of your seed bed, 
the, then you're best to try and get it away from it as much as you can. Three quarters to an inch, is that yep, that's okay. They say better is greater, and you know, if you do mid-row banding with your nitrogen and sulfur or whatever, your liquid, whatever, that's probably the best option, but as long as you get as much space as you possibly can. So, which is around a lot different than any other crop. But you gotta remember, you don't have to put down hundreds of pounds of nitrogen. So it's really just FOSS as your main nutrient. A little bit of, sometimes potassium, but most of it's just around FOSS. So if you've got to wait. Six inches away from the seed, it's probably too far away to make uh, Well, six inches is a fair distance, but if you've got a sideband unit or you can put it off to the side within an inch and a half, that's fine. Yeah, yeah mid-row. <coughs> yeah, they will. And especially if you've got them solid seeded. If you've got a 15 inch row, that bean's got to go quite a ways to find where the fertilizer is, but if you've got them solid seeded, the beans will find those nutrients wherever they are. What about a liquid source of phosphorus? Right? Yep, it's, it's fine. You've got options there as well. You can foliar or feed beans as well. Groovy. Cool beans. <laughs> My summer student said that when he started two years ago, and that's kind of caught on. Cool beans. So, so that's the bean portion of it. Um, it's be, soybeans are going to be a are, are, are going to be a great thing for us. Um, it's going to take a little bit of walking before we run, and some growing pains, as we all know. But uh, um, hey, Manitoba started out trying them, and they've grown them to be a huge crop. And I think we've got a whole bunch of opportunity for us to grow them as well. Markets will develop around them. Some of you may already found those markets. Grain companies are going to pay attention to this, along with corn. Um, after lunch, I'm going to talk more about canola. I'm not going to talk so much about corn, because I'll have a few minutes to talk about corn. <coughs> and I'll do that right now, that as we start to adapt more acres, and corn for us is going to be a huge crop, a bigger crop and quicker growth, simply because we've got those heat units down already. They're more adapted for more acres to make grain corn. With the case of corn, we've got three basic uses. We can either do grain corn, we can do silage, or we can do grazing. So we've got options for growers depending on what their final outcome is to be. But the real focus is around grain. And as markets continue to grow, our success on corn is better than it is on beans. That's just the hard fact rule. Because the heat units are lower, but we're able to maintain higher yields. In the case of corn, there's lots of growth in southern and central Saskatchewan where yields were in 140 bushel an acre range. And at $7 an acre making dry grain corn, that's pretty darn good money. When you pencil out beans versus corn, corn pencils out better than beans. But beans is a good option for us, depending where you are and how like we had good examples you want to have as an alternate crop for, the, for going into your into rotation and things are also very, very good. <coughs> we are looking at earlier maturing corn varieties as well. And I, I don't have a table here. I have a table that I use in the presentation to give you a reference to where that would be. Right now, if you took a line in the province and went Highway 15, kind of from Yorkton all the way across through Watrous over towards Keniston, then start to go in a bit of an angle up to North Battleford, that's where the majority of our corn acres will start to grow. In the southern areas, we've had great success. Um, I still think we've got a lot of acres to be developed, and we have been working and we're anticipating... I think if I remember correctly, it was within the next three years, we'll have a, a 2000 or a 1950 corn heat unit variety that will actually open up more acres to successfully get to grain corn. And grain corn is an option. It's a cereal. Basically, that's the premise behind another option for cereals. And I've grown corn for three years on my farm, and it's been the highest paying crop the last two out of the last three years. This year, I went 77 bushel an acre on my corn. And I got 750 at a local hog market. That was my highest paying crop. Corn also, in terms of setting expectations, we don't normally get it off dry. So as corn acres start to grow, we have to think around having dryers available. And I went through the 80s where everybody dried and everybody did that, and we went away from that as maturities changed, but drying is a portion of corn. To get it down, it'll physiologically be, mat be mature at 32% moisture. But quite often, we won't get enough drying period in our falls to get it down to basically 15 or 16% moisture. We'll have to harvest it at 22 or 23 or 25 ballpark and then dry it down and put it into dry bins. So drying will be an option for corn, but it's still an, ex an excellent option. And markets will develop around corn as well. So,
you do so. About one pound to 1.2 pounds of nitrogen per bushel of corn. That's what the plant needs. So if you want 100 bushel an acre corn, you've got to have about 100 to 125 pounds of nitrogen for that, for that plant. <coughs> yep, yep. It's not a lot different than canola, really, if you think of the blends, and that's how I've, we've, we've started growers out when they're growing corn. If you use your same typical blend you use for, corn, for canola as you do for corn, it's not as critical to have sulfur, but corn still uses sulfur, but that's a good place to start because canola is a high-end crop. But it's not always just from what you put down, it's what your ground's got in residual and what also the ground is able to give up through mineralization. So if you think if you put down 100 pounds of N for your canola, you got 20 left in the ground and your mineralization gives you an extra 20 or 30 pounds, you're in that 140 to 150 pounds of total N throughout the year to be available for the crop. That in theory should put you somewhere around 140 bushel acre corn crop. It is, now that's setting expectations. In southern Saskatchewan, they've hit those yields before. But traditionally, where I want us to think about is 100 bushel an acre corn. And that, I think, is very realistic to get that most every year. With a 2050 corn heat units, crop heat unit variety, you should be able to get that in this area somewhere between 8 or 9, to, nine, nine out of 10 years. And when I look at the last 10 years, the year that screwed us up was 1994. <laughs> but it froze absolutely every or 2004, it, it froze absolutely everywhere, so it didn't matter. But if you took that year out, then you guys in this area were at a 9 out of 10 years. And I think the one year it didn't, it was like just a few corn heat units below the average. So you guys are in a great area to adopt corn because you've got the heat units on average for most years. Uh, for grain corn, you want to be about 26 to 27,000 established. And you usually assume 5% loss. You're somewhere, if you start at 27,000, your seeding rate, you'll end up somewhere around 26. <coughs> we do know with, with corn, the more plants you can get in an acre to grow and reach maturity, the bigger your yield's going to be. If you take a lower heat unit corn, is going to yield less than a higher heat unit corn. It's just how they work. So what we found in the last four years is around 26 is the best probability for getting our grain successfully off. Corn's different than cereals. In the case of cereals, when you want to increase maturity, what do we do? Or decrease maturity. What do we want to do with cereals? We seed them heavier. We crowd the plants. If you do that to corn, they actually take longer. So if you give the corn more space, they actually physiologically mature earlier. It's not months, but it is a matter of a week. It can make a huge difference between 36 and 26. can almost be a week in maturity. Those plants just grow better when they're not as crowded. So we had to find where that fine line, we think it's right around 26. And that's our 100 bushel an acre, 26,000 established plants, 100 pounds of N, two shots of glyphosate. It's less critical. We're finding better results at 15 inch rows and there's actually uh, Monosam and some of the other companies and we've been doing some work internally with Pioneer using 30 inch rows or using actually paired rows. So they're actually going down to where they have 15 inches between their paired rows. 22 inch machines guys are buying but even 15 inches is fine. The whole thing's about spatial variability. Twin row is another one they're using, yeah. We've got some work with twin row. They're actually looking like they're very good. We're finding better results with lower, with closer uh, plant pop or closer row spacings. Then we're able to get more plants into that given area. So when you talk about spatial variability, if you have a 15 inch row and put two corn plant, two corn seeds like this, they're not going to like it. They do like it when it's 30, but you can take a 15 inch row and put them here and stagger them. In other words, you set your discs up to kick them out opposite then you get spatial variability. That's far more critical with corn. So right now it's a trend towards 15 inch machines. Seems to look like it'll work better. But the work that we did in Alberta was the difference between 30 and 15 wasn't huge. It was a little bit of an advantage. So if you're starting out to go to a 30 inch planter, perfectly fine. But you do have to match your header up to your planter as best. That's why twin rows at 30 work very well because we're able to get them through a 30 inch header. And the cost of your header is substantially less on the 30 inch row. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I know everybody loves to go spend money on steel and spend all that kind of stuff and buy all these expensive planters. <coughs> I do err on the size of caution being around the industry for a long time. Don't put steel ahead of agronomy. 
So if you're looking for a piece of equipment that's going to do all your crops, you may not find that. You may have to find something to do the beans and the corn. Find a specialized piece of equipment that does the best job for that to maximize its yield and do good with what we got right now. Because there are people talking to go in that route. And as soon as it becomes the a, a steel of a head of agronomy, then it becomes an issue is where do we go from there? We're going to change that, of course, but it's going to take a lot more work. And we don't have the people or the resources to do all the research like we used to do 20 years ago. We just don't. I'm unfortunately the guy that gets called into the field on 30 inch rows or 22 inch rows with canola and ask how come I don't have enough plants? Because <laughs> you just can't get the ground to cover. So there's lots of things left. Yep, you can do certain things with new planters and that's where we're going to start to evolve. And I guess where I'm going is around the row spacing. What's our max right now? I'm okay with 15 inch rows. I really don't have a problem with it because I know canola will cover the ground very well. But if you get too low and you don't have enough ability with canola, I'm thinking specifically, you can run into some issues that way. So it's a matter of finding where we're going to be in terms of row space and be critical. When you get over that, like 22 and 30 for corn or for canola, it's just not feasible. Just you cannot cover the ground. And then you think of the agronomics about it. Geez, I don't know, is it windy down here at all? How the hell are you going to anchor that into 30 inch rows with canola stubble that's this tall? All that DeKalb stuff that lays right on the ground, you'll never be able to pick that up. Well, we actually will have, we're actually looking at, um, I'll go a little ahead, I hear myself on the canola side of it. <coughs> We've actually looking at, uh, we're going to have some trials this year with shatter resistant material. We've got two varieties that are, will go into co-ops. If they actually meet our criteria internally, that they do what they're supposed to do, we may have a shatter resistant variety being registered. But that's up to me. I make that call. I'm the one who looks at it and decides if it's any good. And yeah, it might, it, it's got to meet a bunch of things for me in order to do it. <coughs> 20 some years of working with canola, it's still pretty risky. We had that conversation at the back about it. But it's a step in the right direction. It's a game changer. You guys down here, if you can straight cut canola, absolutely. And I know guys are having real good success at it, but there's still a lot of risks. But if we get shatter resistant or shatter tolerance to a certain level that's acceptable, then we do the crop architecture, change how the plant grows, then we've got a lot more windows opening up, and it gets really, really good for us. So when they, when they do the straight cut part of it on the canola, how are they getting it coming even enough to actually straight cut? Uh, you mean in terms of just now what guys are doing? Yeah. Well, the, I think a lot of guys are having their best success with the Liberty systems because they're able to go in and pre-harvest. Whereas in the Roundup system, they've got to have some pretty good even maturities in order for it to work. And in the years that I did it with Canola Council and did all those on-field scale farms trials, <coughs> you know, we had maturities that were, it was, it was, it was mature. But the sea moisture content was 13, 14% because it was still a living organism, was pulling moisture out of the ground. And if you could manage it, it's okay if you could blend, but if you've got 10,000 bushels of 13% moisture, that's just dynamite. Like there's things around moisture, if you can dry that plant down. So with this, then it's a different option. Straight combinable canola means you don't have to worry so much about that. It won't be a shatterist. And so what if you have to leave it two months till it's bone dry? It's not an issue because it'll hold together. It'll always dry down, it normally does, but unless you can hasten it by harvest to pre-harvest, then you can go in with a reglone when it's basically fully mature, give it a half rate of Reglone, enough to dry it down to get sea moisture content where you need to be, and then you're good to go. But right now, you gotta wait till your canola crop's almost 100% ripe, and then it just ends up, there's just that risk of shattering, which is what we're dealing with right now. We're just not quite there. We're close.